Hello there. Welcome to this Zoom into Soil webinar. I'm Jack Hannam and I'm the President-elect of the British Society of Soil Science. And I'm really excited to welcome you to our fifth Zoom into Soil webinar. And this one's on soil functions. And we've got two brilliant speakers today with very different perspectives on soil functions, basically how soil can be used to catch criminals and also to mitigate climate change. So today's event has been supported by one of our regional groups, the Northern Soil Network, which is chaired by Manoj Menon, and he will be leading the question and answer session after the presentations today. So before I welcome our two speakers, I'd just like to briefly introduce you to the British Society of Soil Science as hosts of today's webinar. We're an established international membership organisation and charity committed to the study of soil in its widest aspects. So we bring together those working in academia, practitioners, implementing soil science in industry and all others with a keen interest in soils. And this year we'll be running 10 Zoom into soil webinars with one already taken place, which was on soil organic matter. So do check our YouTube channel to catch up on that one. And the next in the series will take place over the next months. So please do go back and check our website for further announcements on that one. So in addition to our you know, successful webinar series, we also produce advice and guidance for our members and specifically for sort of allied professionals who are working with soils. Um, recently, we've published on our website two guidance documents, one on agricultural land classification and a second one on soil and land quality. So assessing agricultural land classification is primarily aimed at development and planning control professionals. So to help them evaluate these um, ALC reports that are submitted in support of planning applications or spatial plans in England and Wales. And the second guidance on soil and land quality supports agricultural and environmental consultants with how they can best obtain and make use of information on soils and agricultural land quality. So it's really good to see so many of you here. So before we begin with the presentations, just some basic housekeeping. Um, all your microphones have been muted because there's lots of you on the, on the webinar. Brilliant to see um, everyone joining. Um, and we'll be taking questions at the end of both presentations. And my colleague Manoj will monitor these for us. So he'll be asking those at the end of the second presentation. So please do submit your questions at any point in time during the webinar, um, but do make sure you do this by 12.50 to allow us to get through as many of the questions as we can. So although you can probably see there's a raise your hand button, we won't be using this unless the presenter specifically asks for a show of hands. Uh, today's presentation, for those of you um, that need them, um, they've been awarded basis points and are um, NRSO CBD points. So if you're registered with either of these bodies, please do contact us um, after the event to claim those CPD points. And just to let you know, finally, of course, that obviously we'll be recording today's presentation and it will be available on our YouTube channel after the event. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce our first presenter, which is Professor Lorna Dawson. So Lorna is a principal scientist and she is head of forensic soil science at the James Hutton Institute in Aberdeen. She's a chartered scientist. She's a fellow of the Institute of British Soil Scientists, a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, and also a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. She's published extensively over hundred scientific papers, books and book chapters, and is the science advisor and the knowledge exchange lead for the environment for the Scottish Environment, Food, Agriculture and Research Institutes. She's an advisor for the National Crime Agency, a trained expert witness and holds diplomas in civil and criminal law. And she's worked on over 150 cases with the police agencies and lawyers across the UK and overseas. So I'm really excited to hear what Lorna's got to say. Over to you for your presentation. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jack, and thank you all for coming along today. So I'm going to take you on a little journey through soil 
Um, we've never been in a time when soil has never been shown to be so important in terms of the pandemic of COVID, how we can help deliver solutions, climate change, biodiversity loss, economic uncertainty, food security, all these issues, soil can help help deliver an answer and a solution to these problems. You might wonder why um, it's soil function and how we're zooming in to look at those functions within forensic science. Well, it's vitally important we understand the characteristics on which we can describe soil, how we can characterize soil, because that and those functions help us differentiate between the different soils. So it's going to be a very quick whistle-stop tour through soil. I'll first of all talk about how uh, forensic soil science has developed, search, how it's applied to help police narrow down areas of search, and how it's used in trace evidence comparison. So where you've got a question soil that's on an object or a person, how can we compare that with a known soil at a crime scene and do trace evidence comparison? And lastly, why it's so important that we communicate that science, soil science, we communicate it in the right way to the right people at the right time. It was the Romans that first used soil, soil forensic principles, and by looking at the soil on the hooves of their enemy. And using that, they could work out where their enemies were coming from. And then it was in uh, Northern Europe where Alberg used the principle of transference that was where gold coins were stolen from inside barrels on a railway and substituted with sand. So what he did was he went to every station along that route, took reference sand from there and compared it with the substituted sand. And he found it was one particular railway. And the police went there and they, they seized and they took the suspects and compared the sand and found that indeed it was these people that had been stealing the gold coins. And then it was Hans Gross, who was actually um, studied petrology and topography. He first used it um, within his approaches. Later on, it was George Pop, who um, in, in Frankfurt and then later in, um, in the wider European continent, he applied the principles of trace evidence comparison. In the early case in 1904, he used the handkerchief of a victim and compared the minerals on that handkerchief with coal dust that was found under the suspect's nails. And then later in the Filbert case in 1908, he first used the layering that is found on items of footwear to identify multiple locations that the perpetrator had walked. And this can be watched on a BBC Four channel later. Sherlock Holmes, um, of course, he was a great favourite of mine when I was growing up. I, I read Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's books. And, and even in those books with, with the fiction, he was showing a clear understanding of soil science, geology and environmental issues. In four of his books, he featured um, soil, uh, and it, indeed it, it turned around the other way, that in 1906 and 1912, he actually gave evidence in court, which led to the acquittal of two individuals. The study of Scarlet, um, Watson mentioned that um, Holmes's understand of geosciences, that it was practical but limited, but he could tell at a glance different soils from each other. And after walks has shown me splashes on his trousers and told me by their colour and consistence in which part of London he had received them. And indeed, um, the mapping that is available, the characteristics of the soil that is now spatially available, including colour, can help us work out where something came from. Indeed, now we've, we've got more sophisticated techniques and we can work with smaller amounts of trace evidence, but the principles are still there. But it was Edmund Lockhart in 1910 that established the transfer, the principle that whenever two objects come into contact, there's transfer. But it's the methods of detection 
to pick up that transfer that is important, as is equally well the consideration of how that trace got there. Because from the perspective of what else could have happened, it's important to consider that it may have occurred by secondary or even tertiary transfer. But soil or geological material was characterized by Locard as dust or dirt, but it falls into the same range of, of features such as pollen, glass, any minute particles, fibers that can be found at a scene that potentially could have transferred from the scene to the perpetrator or from the perpetrator to the victim, the triangle of transfer. But I thought I'd use um, James Hutton, um, upon which the James Hutton Institute, where I work, um, we very much follow the principles of him as a great agriculturalist, a geologist. The soil, soil is a living bridge between, between rock uh, and, and life. And, and we are to examine the construction of this present earth in order to understand the natural operations of time past. So to understand how soil functions. But in this case, it's to understand what happened and where did it happen, that it helps us as forensic scientists answer those questions. But not all soils are equal. As we know, they've got different characteristics and hence they've got different functions. But soil has got the properties that make it an ideal trace evidence type. It's individualistic. It's a high probability of transfer and remaining on that object it's transferred to. It's often not able to be seen. So it's invisible to the perpetrator that they've actually obtained some material. It can quickly be collected, separated and concentrated if necessary. And the merest traces can be characterized. And also importantly, it can be put in the context of other data that we contain in databases. I'm going to put one question out to you there now. What do you think is the most common questioned item that we examine in our laboratories? Is it vehicles? Is it clothing? Is it footwear? Or do you think it's the tools and objects used to dig? I hope you're all voting now. And the polls, I believe, um, I'm not sure, I can't see the results now on my screen, but maybe we'll come back to the, that at the end. That's come up as 50% footwear, Lorna. Thank you. Well, 50% of you are correct. It's predominant uh, questioned item that we look at is indeed footwear. But of course, we have a whole range of other objects that we do look at. But it's soil, as I said, it can transfer to footwear, to objects, to people, to clothing, because it can often be unconsolidated. Often when it's wet, it's much more readily transferable, of course. We can look for indicators in that soil that gives, give us information about what happened, the route to a scene, where someone's gone, to establish a common approach path. We can look at whether something's decomposed in a particular location or not. Here we've got a large, a very visible indicator, but sometimes it's more subtle. We can look at vehicles, um, the wheel arches on the wheels within the footwell mat. But again, we have to be very careful and look at individual um, aggregates, which are more likely to be a single source. Um, tools in the boot, we can look at material on the front and the back of a spade. And they can tell us about uh, the different horizons where someone may have dug. We can look at the soil evidence on uh, clothing under fingernails, and indeed even in the washing machine if someone has cleaned their trousers after an event. But it is footwear, as you said, 50% uh, of our, uh, as you say, you got it right. It's the samples on that footwear. We can look at the different layers. We can work out different locations and the order of the visiting of those places that the person obtained that material. Uh, we can also look at vegetation that's embedded within that soil. And here we can also look at um, likely location and action that occurred at a scene. The wonderful thing about 
soil and footwear is that we can combine it with other evidence because in any case it'll never just be one item of evidence it can be witness evidence it can be physical evidence such as soil it can also be the marks that are left behind that tells us information about what the size of that person the type of shoes they've been wearing as well as transfer out and into the scene as I said earlier, the, the geoscientist, the soil scientist, the geologist, we help answer the where did it happen question. We also answer how did it happen? And sometimes give indications of when it happened and what happened. All of these help the investigator work out when and what happened and where it happened. But we're all part of a team. So the forensic scientists and the Soil scientists, many of you will be soil scientists, so your discipline is soil science, and you're developing the new methods that we as forensic soil scientists can use in the future. Uh, we help the police, and eventually, ultimately, it is used in court as evidence. So as we know, soil science is a study, a scientific study of soil as a natural resource. All the F word does is relate it to the law, and that can be criminal, civil, environmental, all aspects of where the legal process is involved. But the pedologist is not the only ologist that um, helps the police work out what happened. There's pathologists, entomologists, taphonomists, geophysicists, ecologists, palynologists, archaeologists. All, all of us help, depending on the case question, in one way or another. We as forensic soil scientists help determine clues for search. And as I said earlier, we also test for links between a person, object, or a place, and then ultimately present that as evidence in court. So I'm very quickly going to take you through a scene where we've got a victim found, as is often the case, by a dog walker who detects the scent. And when the body's found, a common approach path is established. PPE is put on, and the scene is examined. The scene is examined for any potential clues, any evidence, in geology and botany. All of those are carefully retained, photographed and sampled. The areas we are interested in are the hands, the feet wear, the clothing and any areas around the head. Careful sampling, as in all soil signs um, in the field, careful sampling to characterise that scene is done, whether that's rural or an urban or peri-urban areas. Considering of potential entry or exit routes for taking reference samples, potentially if a body is found in the surface where it's been deposited, we can do targeted sampling, where likely someone stood. And the depth of sampling will also depend on the environmental conditions at the time. Photography is taken in a wide angle shot so we can put in context the sampling location. Sampling is then carried out and carried out in context with features such as car tire marks or footwear marks. Sampling is taken carefully and that is retained in an evidence bag and then into the lab. So the next stage is looking at items of clothing and recovering any physical items within that soil that can link to the scene. But as we know, soil is a complex medium and we characterize it with both the inorganic part, which is related to the geological parent material, as well as man-introduced elements, and the organic part, where that tells us about what vegetation and what decomposition has been going on at that location. And we also have occasionally the biological aspect, which is vitally important for soil functioning in terms of agricultural use, but occasionally it can be used also to characterise habitat, to take us to a place that it came from. But there's a whole range of different methods potentially we can use, but in criminal cases tested in court have been a gas chromatography and the organic biomarker composition, and also um, X-ray diffraction for characterising the mineral profile. But indeed, we have additional other methods which can be used. So it's the mineral material, the organic matter, the water and the air. So for uh, the mineralogy, we would use X-ray diffraction. And for the organic matter, we would use gas chromatography, where we could quantify the amount of each compound that is present in that sample. 
in terms of volatile organic profiles, we also use gas chromatography. And we can tell by that composition of volatiles in the sample, the likely source. Here, it's just comparing the difference between um, the profile that you get here with dogs, and here's the profile you get as a human source. And again, it's the dogs that help us determine the location of where a body might be found. And we're working on research um, with Germany and Portugal on identifying these organic compounds, which can give us an indication of when the body had buried. And we're also working on microbial tools to help us look at the more short-term time intervals to establish um, the answers to questions of when a body was buried. But we put all of that within uh, geographical information systems where we have the data. Uh, we have the data that is spatially referenced and we can compare those attributes both um, on a map-based system, but also um, electronically and also in electronic digital formats such but also south of the border, um, Cranfield also has the Lanzes system, which covers the soils of England and Wales. So question number two, what does GIS stand for? Is it geographically integrated storage? Is it geographical system? Or is it geographical integrated system? I'm sure we've got a lot of um, people that will know the answer to that one. Have we got the poll ready on that? Sorry, Lorna, so we have 90% of people have said geographical information system. Correct, I'm glad. I would have expected to get a high um, response rate for that one. Well done, everyone. And it is that geographical information system where we couple the soil, the geology, the plant material, other intelligence that comes from the police inquiries. So it lets us take that system, take down the layers of soil, whether it's regional or local level, take it down, use and integrate the soil characteristics that we have identified. We characterize that question soil. So we narrow it down and we exclude the areas that it could not have come from. We exclude until we can include the characteristics from our database that takes us to a specific location that it came from. And this was a, a piece of work that was done by BBC4 and Gabrielle Weston um, sent us a Wellington boot she'd worn and we got within 700 metres of where she'd walk. So not to be outdone, uh, BBC1, the one show asked us to look at soil on a item of footwear. And again, we have no idea where it come from, the whole of Scotland, the whole of that area, and we narrowed it down and again got within 700 metres of where Morty Johnson, on this case, had walked. The shoe itself, we can narrow down spatially the information where it has come from. So all of that together helps us determine where something has come from. And indeed, we take all that information so that we can take the police and then go back and georeference, compare it with the location of the scene, compare it with alternative locations, and help put together the solution of what happened. And in this case, uh, the victim had been murdered at the pine forest. She'd been dumped on the riverside. And that is where the perpetrator's soil matched that of the top of the bank where the sampling carried out. We excluded the victim's footwear. It hadn't, she hadn't walked, she'd been thrown down that bank. So that established using a combination of methods what had happened, using that evidence to say where that soil had come from, combining investigative and evidential information. And the last question is, where do you think the main duty of the expert, in this case, the expert soil scientist, where does our duty lie? Is it the defence? Is it the accused? Is it the prosecutor? Or is it the court? So where does everyone think the duty of the court expert lies? So we've had 77% say the court. Well done. That is the answer. Your duty as an expert very much lies with the duty is to the court, no matter what you find. 
So on that point, I will end. And that is why it's so important that we do these sessions and we work with um, all the people that present and understand evidence so that when you, the jury, you might be called as a member of the public to act as a juror, then you are making the right decisions for the right reasons in that important forum, the court. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thanks so much, Lorna. This is a really fantastic insight into the forensic applications of soil science. Not, not many people know about them. So it just goes to show you need to be careful uh, where you tread and what you tread in. Um, we'll be taking questions just as a reminder. Thanks uh, at the end. If you have questions for Lorna, we'll be taking those at the end. Do use the question button um, if you wish to pose a question and Manoj will ask them for on your behalf at the end of the session. So I'd like to introduce um, our next speaker, um, and this is uh, Dr. Um, Marcello Galdos. So welcome, thanks very much. So he's offering a completely different perspective looking at climate smart soils. And just to introduce him, um, Marcello is a, a university academic fellow in modeling food security and climate impacts at the Institute for Climate and Atmospheric Sciences based at the University of Leeds. Uh, he's a soil scientist with extensive um, experience, over 25 years experience in agricultural systems, climate change mitigation and adaption, and soil health. And he uses um, crop and soil measurements and modeling to assess the impact of land use, management and climate on crop yields, on soil organic matter, soil moisture, nutrients, and greenhouse gas fluxes in both food and bioenergy production. So I'm really interested to hear about the functions of soils from a climate perspective. Over to you, Marcelo. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Uh, can you skip my screen, actually? Can you confirm if you can see the first slide? Yeah, I can see that. Thank you, appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Jack. Thanks, Menon, for the invitation as well. Um, yes, so I'll be talking about climate smart soils, uh, but with a framework on soil function. So we'll get started uh, thinking about this wide range of soil uh, or functions that soils have, you know, all the way from more engineering infrastructure functions uh, to biotech. Uh, to filtering water, to biodiversity, uh, but I'll be focusing a bit on the on an agricultural perspective, agricultural systems and climate. So we'll be talking more about the climate regulation, carbon sequestration, and producing food fiber and renewable energy from soils. So those particular functions are really essential if we want to tackle uh, you know, the global challenges of food insecurity, of, of the climate crisis that we're in. Um, so, we, you know, and speaking of climate and climate change uh, and climate impacts, uh, it's not just some abstract notion of global mean temperatures increasing over time. Basically, you know, according to some of the best available uh, and, and data, uh, the, the best available simulations that we have, for example, for the UK, things are changing, seasons are changing, the way we experience weather and climate is changing. And we are seeing uh, some of the latest projections, including both, you know, pessimistic and optimistic scenarios, low emissions, high emissions. Uh, but the, the main message here is that you know, there's a greater chance of hotter, drier summers and warmer, wetter winters. So things that are really, really important for farmers, for the food system in general, but farmers really live uh, the reality of knowing when to plant, when to, what to grow and how to grow crops uh, and, and, and to raise livestock. So really affected by that. Uh, but also speaking of soil, quality, soil health, there's really the potential for climate change to accelerate processes of degradation. We see that the best available land to grow food 
might decrease in the UK if nothing is done to adapt or to mitigate that, uh, according to the latest projections. Uh, in some of the work that we've done um, in the secondment at the Met Office was looking at the role of rainfall in, in producing erosion, so what we call rainfall erosivity, uh, and how that might change with, with climate, different climate projections. And on the left side, you see the classic way of looking at soil erosion and, and estimating soil erosion, the universal soil loss equation. One of the factors there is rainfall erosivity, which is basically the intensity of rainfall, duration, and volume, a combination of those. But on the right side, you see some, some of the work that we've done actually using the data uh, from this later, latest projections, looking at historical erosivity in the UK. Uh, projections, but also future projections. And uh, if you run your eyes, you know, from the left to the right uh, on, on, on those maps, and, and those are two different, just two different approaches, two different modeling approaches, but they converge in, uh, in, in, in the output that there is a propensity likelihood of having more erosive events, uh, more storms that will cause more erosion in future climate. So that's a problem. Uh, and how do we manage that? How would we protect soils? How do we maintain soil quality in future climate? Another uh, important aspect, sometimes the elephant in the room is nitrogen. Uh, when we talk about climate. Uh, basically, what you're seeing there is, uh, is probably the best uh, assessment of sources or emissions or sinks of the way uh, nitrous oxide uh, uh, is broken down in the atmosphere as well, both natural and, uh, and, and related to human activities. Uh, but what I wanted to highlight here is the importance of agriculture in this global budget. Uh, basically, uh, 3.8 million tons of nitrogen are emitted annually by fertilizers and manure from livestock. So a big share, you can see by the size of the arrow going up, which are the sources, you can see that's a really relevant source and um, we need to do something about it. So the Food and Agriculture Organization came up a few years ago with this concept of climate smart agriculture, which is basically the realization that we need to do something uh, and agriculture provides an opportunity. Uh, it, it, it is not to be seen as a villain, it, uh, but it, it, it is to be seen as having a role uh, in reducing emissions, but also removing emissions from the atmosphere or CO2 from the atmosphere and storing in biomass and soils, as we call mitigation, but also realizing that climate change is upon us. Uh, it, it is happening. It will continue to happen and we need to adapt how we grow crops, how we raise livestock, uh, and, and we need to build resilience to extreme events, uh, to heat waves, to droughts, uh, to floods. But at the same time, we shouldn't forget, and that's why what I like about this concept of climate smart agriculture, that we're talking about livelihoods, we're talking about people uh, uh, and farmers uh, and the whole food supply uh, chain, and, 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 and then we need to think about how do we do that? How do we mitigate, we adapt, we still have yields, maintain or increase yields, but more than that, incomes, profit, livelihoods. Uh, and all I'm doing in this talk is really kind of reframing that to soils, like how, we do, how do we manage soils in a way that's climate smart? Uh, one example, is and, and, and something that we need to do is really to measure things. We need to understand what happens uh, in this interface between soils, plants, and the atmosphere. Uh, and an example is the University of Leeds experimental farm in which you're embracing uh, this, this whole new world of uh, agri-technology, of sensors, of internet of things. Uh, so applying that to agriculture and measuring uh, soil moisture, carbon, nitrogen, yields, animal products, using probes in the soil, for example, for soil moisture, uh, drones with, with, with 
sensors on them, measuring greenhouse gas fluxes uh, from soils, uh, particular material on, a, on in the atmosphere on a farm setting, uh, and remote sensing, for example. So once we understand better uh, those processes, we have data on on those processes and how agriculture system, agricultural systems are managed. Uh, one very important to to understand future impacts is modeling. So we basically simulate a, a the, the agricultural systems in a computer uh, using crop models, uh, using mathematical uh, equations that uh, are relevant for specific processes uh, for plant growth uh, and how climate uh, uh, parameters such as precipitation, temperature, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere affect crop growth and crop yields. Uh, and then we can integrate that to the projections I was talking about uh, and, and how potentially, depending on and how we behave as a society uh, in socioeconomic aspects, but also emissions, uh, in, you know, what, what are the potential CO2 concentrations, what are the patient, potential temperature uh, in parameters into the future and how would that impact crops? How can we improve crop breeding, for example, for future climate to make more uh, uh, climate resilient uh, systems? And then uh, uh, as it, we can really look into soil processes and potentially how can we store carbon in soils in different forms and you can see uh take a look at last month's presentation on you know the paradigm uh the current paradigm on how to understand uh carbon dynamics in 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 soils and it's you know related to minerals is it more in particulate material is it going to be stored longer or for a short term is it more accessible to microbes or not uh but we use models to understand how potential impacts of climate on those processes as well. And here I'm gonna go through some examples of this model measurement integration to assess, let's say the climate smartness uh, of agriculture. So for example, in, in bioenergy production, uh, sugar cane sometimes is harvested by burning. So before harvest, the leaves are burned and that's common globally. Uh, and, 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 but there's a, a, a trend a phase out of phasing out biomass burning, uh, and that implies in having a mulch layer, so having crop residues on the soil. What we did uh, in this paper here is both in, in South Africa and Brazil is look at the potential carbon sequestration over time as you leave that mulch on the soil, as it decomposes, uh, and, and you can see there's potential increases in soil carbon. It does change from where you started. Uh, so if you have a higher carbon content in the beginning, the potential is not as big as if you're starting from a degraded soil as the one in Brazil. But this concept is also being investigated in several projects, uh, for example, in conservation agriculture, which implies leaving residues, but also not disturbing the soil too much. And compared to conventional farming in Malawi, uh, and and we can see you know an, a trend for increased soil carbon content. Uh, but I think an interesting uh, dilemma sometimes that farmers face is that all right, that's fine to leave you know to do soil uh, conservation, leave the residues there, but my the animals actually can make use of that as feed. You can use crop residues to cook uh, for building materials. So, what if you remove part of them uh, for other uses? And we're in running experiments in Bangladesh and modeling as well to understand: can we find an optimal uh, scenario for that? Uh, another uh, uh, relevant thing is that imagine you can X-ray soils and root systems and see what's going on below ground. And, and, and that is possible. That was done uh, in a consortium, the Nucleus Consortium on Nitrogen Use Efficiency. So what we did was compared long-term experiments in uh, uh, no-till, 
or zero tillage uh, on the left side there compared to conventional tillage. And we can see soil pores change, the pore structure change. And that makes soils more resilient to drought, for example. So they retain moisture better, better nutrient cycling. So not just carbon there. Uh, and on the right side, you can see root systems from two different crops, so maize and Congo grass, and the importance of having diversity. If you imagine just growing maize continuously uh, and the impact of intercalating or uh, of integrating, for example, uh, uh, grasses on that, on the potential carbon inputs to the soil, uh, as you can see from that fine root system there uh, of the Congo grass. Uh, another aspect for mitigating is really learning how to manage nitrogen, manage nitrogen fertilizers. And we're partnering with an institute, the Agronomic Institute, a leading group in measuring soil nitrous oxides. Those are chambers uh, that are placed on the soil. And you, you, you can see a summary there at the bottom of fluxes after you apply fertilizer over several trials, over several years. And what we're doing is really co uh, contrasting and trying to understand the correlations uh, uh, and, and the processes related to nitrous oxide. What are the drivers in, in how much fertilizer you applied, when, uh, the temperature of when you applied, physical properties of soil, chemical, and interesting, you know, that's a whole new area of research, uh, biological. So you're looking at soil DNA to understand the communities, uh, the microbial communities that influence nitrous oxide uh, fluxes, and then trying to find ways to reduce those fluxes. And, and in this case, for example, adding an nitrification inhibitor to urea, slow release, uh, improving nitrogen use efficiency reduces the, the emission factor, which is how much nitrogen is lost when you apply fertilizer. Uh, another uh, uh, example of, of this integration of monitoring and modeling uh, is part of the Climate Science for Service partnership uh, that the Met Office has through the Newton Fund. Uh, in this example here, we're integrating remote sensing of vegetation over Brazil, of soil moisture using a satellite that estimates soil moisture, but also sensors, over 600 sensors scattered over an area about seven times in the UK uh, in a semi-arid region, uh, and combining that to the joint UK land uh, environment model, JUICE. Uh, and, and then that helps inform decisions for farmers uh, over drought, for example, and when they could plant uh, and when to expect reductions in yields. Uh, finally, back to the UK, uh, we're developing a framework to combine uh, what Lorna described there, uh, geograph geographic information systems, uh, you know, gridded databases with process-based modeling uh, to really understand impacts, uh, to really understand, uh, you know, under different climate scenarios, land uses and land management systems, what could uh, nitrous oxide fluxes over Yorkshire, what, what are potential soil carbon uh, uh, stock changes over Yorkshire and the, under those scenarios, uh, and including peatland restoration. It's re re highly relevant regionally uh, and part of the net zero strategy, but uh, very, very seldom it is included uh, in, in estimates, climate uh, modeling is included in estimates of uh, peatland restoration. And then uh, to start summarizing, basically, you know, soil carbon, increasing soil carbon in soils is great. Uh, you know, in, it's probably one of the best things that can be done uh, by farmers. It is, it's not just a mitigation strategy. Uh, it can make soils more resilient. So you can see it improves plant available water capacity. So, you know, soils are better able to extend droughts and, but also the structure. So it, the less soil is lost by uh, runoff, more is infiltrated. And also less nutrients are lost to water and the air. So including nitrous oxide. 
Uh, now, there are some caveats for that, and there's a lot of hype about, um, you know, paying farmers uh, or, or large corporation paying farmers to increase soil carbon while, you know, in order to continue burning fossil fuels. And that's a big problem, but we need to think about, you know, there's an upper limit to soil carbon storage. Uh, it can be reversed. Uh, so if you, you increase your soil carbon and then you go into a very intensive tillage, as you, it's, it goes up to the atmosphere again. Uh, and it depends on initial conditions, as I showed in, in that example, uh, and on with sugarcane. And also there are challenges in really measuring, reporting, and verifying changes in soil carbon because of spatial variability and temporal variability. And that's a challenge and an opportunity for science as well. Uh, you, know, you know, things that can be done that I consider climate smart in terms of soils, increasing soil cover as opposed to bare soils, uh, increasing diversity, you know, as opposed to monocropping, uh, increasing, improving nutrient management. So if you know how, when, how much to apply of nutrients, you, you run less of a risk of losing that to the environment increasing organic amendment, so improving in, 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 in soil structure and soil carbon dynamics through more inputs, as opposed to relying only on synthetic fertilizer, and then decreasing soil disturbance. Uh, so you notice that I put that as, as sliders and not as uh, uh, absolutes, or it's not a dichotomy, because I know that farmers deal with decisions uh, related to markets, related to policy, uh, related to practical aspects as well. So those, I think, aspirations, uh, uh, in my opinion, of what climate smart soils are. And then to summarize, my key points are, yes, so, so this aspect uh, that I just mentioned, so livelihoods, profitability in farmer are often missing from discussions on agriculture for climate change. We talk a lot about uh, yeah, mitigation adaptation, but the climate smart approach is really includes uh, uh, likelihoods, uh, uh, yields. Uh, climate smart soil measurement can increase carbon sinks, reduce emissions, and build re resilience against extreme events uh, with caveats and trade offs. Uh, there are obvious, we won't have time to go over all of them, uh, but for example, if you increase uh, if you only focus on, you know, leaving crop residues on the soil and you don't change your nitrogen management, you might be creating optimal conditions for nitrous oxide emissions, for example. Uh, and, 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 and speaking of that, you know, soil nitrogen, water, structure are really relevant, not just carbon. And finally, you know, monitoring, modeling soil properties can really improve our knowledge of climate impacts. And, and really focus on locally appropriate solutions. That's where we feel the impacts of climate and climate change. That's where we need to act. And I'll end here. Uh, just an acknowledgement of partners and funders. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marcelo. That's a really fascinating talk, really great overview of how we can use sort of measurements and, and modeling of soils to understand, you know, the impacts of climate and to mitigate, you know, climate change. And a nice summary at the end there, looking at, you know, management decisions and also the trade-offs needed for those. So um, that's great. So do um, type in your questions now. We've got a few more minutes for you to, to add some further questions. Um, and Manoj has been monitoring the questions as we've been going along um, that you've been sending in. So thanks for those that have come in already. And uh, he will ask the questions um, uh, on your behalf to the panelists here, to the two um, presenters. Uh, so, you've, again, just to remind you, you've got a couple more minutes just to, to submit them, but I think we've had some come through already. So I'll hand over to um, Manoj now to, um, to field those questions. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, hello. Uh, thanks for your fantastic presentations. Um, we have a lot of questions for Marcelo. Um, um, so I will start, start with some of them um, which I found. Uh, the first one is on glad to see your focus is on soil nitrogen management to cut down N2O emissions. For future mitigation, climate mitigation, do you think this may be as at least as important as 
sequestering carbon. Do you want me to repeat, Marcelo? No, I got it. Thank you. <laughs> um, yes, I, I think they're both important. Uh, one aspect to consider is when you reduce emissions, they're reduced, hopefully, uh, you know, for good, you know, for a long time. Uh, when you sequester carbon, there is a limit to how much you can do. Uh, but ideally, you should do both uh, and, and, and strive to do both, especially because what I mentioned about other benefits of increasing organic matter uh, content. Uh, but yes, so, so definitely, and also the point of reducing emissions, we're talking about increasing in efficiency. So really, you're, you're increasing even in, 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 in what you lose you're increasing how much goes to the crop or, or you know, or to the pasture that will be uh, used by livestock. So you're, you're losing less money actually. So by improving efficiency. So there's that aspect as well. Okay. So I have a question for uh, Lorna. I'm just particularly interested in knowing about the organic matter fractions you focus in criminal investigations using soils, because given that they are quite um, uh, vulnerable to decomposition. So what kind of priorities do you give in there? Well, it, it all depends on what the question is. So um, you're right, the organic part is often the main analysis approach we will take because we're often dealing in, in the Scottish situation with organic soils. But it's also because uh, the, they discriminate at about 10 centimetres to a metre, um, while um, the inorganics tend to discriminate more at a kilometre scale. So as you can imagine, the um, spatial resolution of mineralogy or elemental composition can be quite gross over fairly large areas. And that's not always the case because we can look at trace minerals. However, in general, it's the organics that are more specific to the scale of, let's say, where someone stood or where a car drove into a lay-by. And it's much more discriminating and, and therefore made more useful evidentially because it's um, a higher evidential value that it takes you to that particular place rather than uh, somewhere else within that field. So yes, the organic uh, characterization using alkanes and alcohols can be very specific to a particular patch of soil where you've had a unique combination of uh, broken down vegetation and organic matter to that particular place. And it varies with depth, as we know. So it's really um, across a landscape, but they also vary depending on what depth that soil has transferred onto that person or object. Thank, thank you so much. So again, next question to Marcelo about tillage. Um, uh, the question is, um, conservation agriculture keeps uh, plant residues on the surface, but in high clay soils need organic matter at depth to improve soil functions for deeper roots. Perhaps um, we can sometimes move surface trash to the deeper depths by occasional plowing? Yeah, well, I, uh, I do think, uh, you know, solutions are locally appropriate and definitely in some climates and soils, uh, periodical tillage is good, you know, and 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 also when we think about tillage, you know, there's still a lot of debate of how much no-till increases soil carbon in depth. You know, if you think about the the first meter of soils, uh, it it might redistribute, it might be higher carbon at the surface, uh, but that's why I think it's important to, to have a systemic approach, not just think about tillage, but think about plant roots that can contribute in more depth, different, uh, uh, that's the diversity aspect as well. Uh, but many different, uh, we, we, we won't have time to discuss much, but there are other climate uh, aspects, for example, albedo. So how much of solar radiation is reflected from the surface? So it is better to have crop residues than not from that perspective as well. Uh, there's a cooling effect 
uh, yes, so many components. So. Yes, uh, thank you for that. And next one is, uh, should more research have a farmer focus rationale, particularly for net zero agriculture? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, uh, I think that's a connecting question. Maybe what kind of time frame would you need in a field trial to pick up effects of treatments of on erosion using Rusle methods as well? Uh, well, that, that I was I was being funny when it, just, it was a short question. Just compliment. Uh, definitely, farmer-led research is really essential. We can't rely only on experimental stations. So, especially with cheaper sensors and farmers, you know, working with more data, that's really, really relevant. But sorry, and then you have another question on Bruce Lee. Sorry. Yeah, repeat? yeah, so yeah. Um, can you repeat, please? So, so, what kind of time frame would you need in a field trial to pick up effects of treatments on soil erosion using Bruce Lee methods? Well, you, Rusli is, is not really applicable on that scale. Uh, it's usually, you know, used to understand, uh, you know, regional impact. Uh, if you if you want to learn about or assess uh, impact at the field scale, it's really, I think, a practical aspect of of uh, uh, observing, measuring. Uh, there are some high resolution, you know, models and everything, but it's really a, a more of an, a practitioner aspect of, you know, seeing how much sediment is transported, uh, how much r runoff you have. You can you you can have measurements for that as well uh, at a finer resolution. Yes, thank even, you very even much. Even nowadays, even nowadays with you know with, with drones and and imaging techniques, that that's a cutting edge, I think, of that area. Yeah, again, there is another, sorry. Can I add also um, to that question about should should farmers be involved? I think it's absolutely essential that farmers are involved from the very outset at designing experiments and also involved in the pilots. It's got to be a priority that we work with um, the people whose lives are most affected by uh, the knowledge that we gain. And also it's important that they contribute to policy development because they're the ones that know their soils. If you work on farms, work with farmers, you know that they know the characteristics quite firmly in their mind how they behave under different conditions. So for the future, we have to work with farmers right from the outset and right to the end conclusion of the developing and designing new tools and techniques. I do have a, another question for you, Lona. Is, uh, can genetic signature be used with soils? I believe it's related to the forensics. Um, genetic signature, I'm not sure if that is plant genetics or soil genetics, um, and both can be used. And indeed, we have used individual plant fragments where we've ascertained the, the DNA and we've compared the, that particular fragment with a particular species. It depends on what species are there um, involved. Uh, soil DNA is very variable. It's not yet been tested in court. And one of the issues about it is that it is affected by environment. So we get we don't yet know which characteristics, which part of the genome in a soil at a particular time will be affected if someone, say, put a boot in the cupboard and it's been there for three months. That will vary. That um, that microbiome will be different to that at the crime scene. So maybe in the future, hopefully, it will be something that will be able to be used, but not right at the moment, only for intelligence. I think we have finished our time for questions. Apologies for uh, not taking all the questions. We have so many. Um, so I think it's nearly the time to stop uh, the questions. Well, thanks very much, Manol, for um, organising those. So really good to see so many questions coming in. It's obviously um, sparked a lot of interest from the attendees. So, um, so on behalf of the British Society of Soil Science, I'd like to express our gratitude to our speakers, Lorna and Marcelo, today for presenting their really fascinating perspectives on two very different uh, soil functions. And thanks also to you, Manol, also for again fielding the questions but also supporting the webinar through the northern soil network 
and many thanks to all of you, the attendees. We've had many of you on, on the uh, webinar today um, for submitting all of those really excellent questions. You'll find a quick survey, feedback survey when you leave the webinar. So we hope you have time to just complete that. And also, if you want to look at some of the talks again, you can watch the recording of this webinar. It will be available after this on our YouTube channel. So do keep an eye out on the British Society of Soil Science website for announcements for the next Zoom Into Soil webinar and also other events that the Society is hosting. So we hope to see you again soon. Thanks very much for attending and uh, goodbye. <laughs>